there's so much mystery to seabirds. There's so much still to be discovered and so much we don't know. And the same can be said for all birds. If you have an inquiring enough mind, I think there's mm. a, amazement and wonder in every bird. But seabirds are such a big group that are so charismatic and well-known, particularly when you look at albatross, that we have such little idea of what they actually do in so many facets of their biology and ecology. Mm. So that's where the academic interest is built from. But it was being blown away by that first experience that really got me on seabirds. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Birding Today podcast, where birders come together to discuss the joy of birding. Thanks for being here. Let's jump right into the episode today. Today's guest grew up in Tasmania and was first inspired by birds while traveling on family holidays as a young child. He was lucky to be able to bird around Australia throughout child, um, childhood and young adulthood, and these experiences led to him studying biology at university. While studying, he developed a particular interest in seabirds, which has resulted in him spending many days at sea around southeastern Australia, and recently moving to Melbourne to start a PhD in seabird conservation ecology. Fabulous. He's also worked as an ecologist, tour guide, and teacher, and has volunteered in several community organizations, hoping to share an interest in birding with as many people as possible. So please welcome Peter Vaughan on the show. How are you, Peter? I'm really well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, not a problem. Well, thank you for the time. Um, and let's jump right into the first question of the show, um, which I ask every time. What brings you joy in birding? Oh, where to start? I think I love the whole pipeline of birding from right from the get go. You're thinking about what you want to see, where you want to go and starting the research and looking up different species, different sites, locations, planning out a trip, even if it's a short twitch. From the travel, even just getting in the car and driving long distances is enjoyable to me, to actually seeing birds, finding them, and being in that moment out in nature and having a unique and special experience each time. And cycling all of that back around to wondering why a bird's where it is or what it's doing and moving into sort of learning and discovery. I love it all. Yeah. Well said. Very well said. I agree with you on the, on the travel aspect. I, I really enjoy long drives. Um, the other, the other day, just yesterday, I went to up, up Mount Lewis road actually. Um, and from Cairns, you know, it's not, it's not that close to Cairns. You've got to drive. I don't know how long is it? It's, I don't even know. I should know, but it's, you know, you, you got to kind of have a drive to get there and you know, it's, it's time I was on my own. So it's time alone in the car and you know, you can listen to podcasts or, and you can kind of, you know, keep your eyes out for birds while you're on the road. And, um, and, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's a whole, an, an all encompassing thing, isn't it? The joy of birding for sure. Absolutely. And I find that the travel aspects often overlooked, particularly driving, not only is it time to yourself or with friends if you're out birding together, but you happen on some pretty good things just driving along random roadsides. Um, I'm sure we've all had some great experience seeing something we weren't expecting on the way to a bird or a site. That's right. And I think it would be <laughs> it would be remiss not to point out that, uh, you know, we, we should uh, it's it's important to always keep your eyes on the road and not, you know, <laughs> carried away. And, you know, because you know how it is when you see a raptor on a on a fence post or something, the instinct is to just stop like, oh, stop. So it's it's important to for, for all for everyone listening that A don't absolutely <laughs> safe driving first. We go. <laughs> well there you go and and it's just that you know birds are so visible and they're everywhere and that's why even when driving you can you can you can do birding um and that's especially true i guess in um in wetlands i'm thinking of um of werribee western treatment plant you know you, yeah. you do a lot of birding just from your car you know um you can just you can just go and so um before we get into um sort of the the the, the, the meat and potatoes of the episode you're you're in melbourne at the moment right Yes, yes, I am. But you originally, uh, you're from. Are you from Tasmania? 
Well, t- technically, originally, I'm from New Zealand, but we moved to Tasmania with family when I was really young. I would have been three, four years old. So functionally, Tasmanian, yeah. Excellent, yeah. So, so talk talk me through the the journey that you had in terms of your birding. What what first sparked your interest? Was it here? Was it was it here in Australia? Oh yes, yes, mm. absolutely. I think. It's probably a relatively generic story of developing an interest in nature first and then birds, like you say, being the most obvious and visible animals often out in the environment. And I started off with documentaries, birds in the backyard when I was really, really young, but particularly when I first travelled more broadly around Australia when I was, I think I was eight at that point, and spending time reading a bird book, well, a minute eight, realistically looking at the pictures <laughs> in a bird book, and then relating all of those amazing, colourful little animals to what I was actually seeing out and about. And it built, it sort of meandered on as a, a general interest. And then when I was, I think, 13, I got my first reasonable camera, first DSLR, and was looking for subjects to shoot and went, huh, birds, camera, there's there's a bit of a connection here. Right. And it then built into finding more birds and travelling to more locations and then phased back around to absolutely being primarily driven by birds and bird watching and it keeps cycling in that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I see. That's quite a common theme as well, isn't it? Photography. A lot of people get into birding through photography, I think more, more than, more than one would think maybe, or I don't know, like, because it's, it's, there's, there is a distinction, I think, or maybe, maybe you disagree, but between photography proper and birding. Um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But there, but there's so much overlap as well that it's hard to, 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 um, uh, what would you say? Uh, to find the line between them. Does that make sense? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I think it's less of a hard line and more where photography phases through nature photography into bird photography, which eventually becomes birding, where you're so into attempting to find new species or locations that that becomes almost more consuming than trying to get the shot. Yeah. But they're absolutely not mutually exclusive in the sense of there being a hard boundary i would say at least right do you do much photography whilst you're birding these days or less so nowadays i definitely fall in and out of it i primarily run with a camera much to the horror of most of the birders i know i do have a pair of binoculars now but i didn't for a while (laughs) but I, I, i fall in and out of it i'm definitely in a phase at the moment of enjoying more exploratory birding and finding locations and particularly getting into LGAs and that type of tragic nerdery that <laughs> consumes lots of e-birders. Well, that's right. Well, <clears throat> now that you brought it up, let's, let, let, let's dive into that. Um, do you, have you been using e-bird a long time? And, and if so, how do you use it? Are you, are you quite diligent? Are you quite into it? Are you quite competitive? What's uh <laughs> Into it, definitely. Competitive, eh, somewhat. There's a time and a place. Diligent, <laughs> may, maybe not as much as I should be or as much as I'd like to be. Mm. I have grand aspirations every time I go out on a road trip that this will be the one where I e-bird everything and I get mm. two or three days in and then think, ah, you know what, I'll be able to flesh most of this out from the notes <laughs> once I get back, back to right. the property and then maybe four or five of the real hot spots ever make it onto ebird in the end that's really interesting because when you're right a lot of especially when it's a big road trip that we're talking about say you go from melbourne up to the mallee for three four days a lot of the birds you're going to see are incidental roadside birds right and that's you know <laughs> and I, I, I whenever i can i stop I, I i pull over when it's safe and do an incidental list um, but <laughs> if it happens every every kilometer, you're not going to get anywhere, you know. So yeah. th- that's th- there's that as well. Um, but eBird is 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 fabulous, and um, 
and it's got lots of different angles um, to it, which we can maybe touch on later when we talk about your your, your PhD and, and conservation. Um, but let's let's jump into the into the seabirds then, um, because you're you're particularly passionate about seabirds. Why why seabirds in particular? It's a great question, in fact, because it's a bit like one that I reckon will come up later, a favourite bird. It's difficult to answer. I think I must have been 13 or so when I did my first pelagic and just being out with so many albatross and petrels and at that time of year we had plenty of prions up around the boat was just mind-blowing, a totally different experience and a different angle on birding. And I was also really inspired by some of the bird watchers on that boat who were able to call these seabirds that I'd never even heard of at that point or had maybe looked at in a book once or twice, who could call a tiny speck in the distance as an unheard of bird, and they'd be right. And it would come into the back of the boat, you'd have a good look, take some photos, go and review later, and it was all right. And that blew me away as sort of a new standard to birding because I hadn't birded socially up until that point. I hadn't been out with others and sort of experienced a gun birder who really knows their stuff. Yeah. And I was hooked on that. And then learning more about them and doing more reading and pre-reading for the next pelagic, there's so much mystery to seabirds. There's so much still to be discovered and so much we don't know. And the same can be said for all birds. If you have an inquiring enough mind, I think there's mm -hmm. a, amazement and wonder in every bird. But seabirds are such a big group that are so charismatic and well-known, particularly when you look at albatross, that we have such little idea of what they actually do in so many facets of their biology and ecology. Mm. So that's where the academic interest is built from. But it was being blown away by that first experience that really got me on seabirds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that the, the, the mystery that you're referring to there can be... Um derived from the fact that the habitat in which these birds live is is so hostile to us like it's you know open ocean really that's and and that's that's probably why and and they only come to land rarely to breed you know it's it's it really is incredible and i i quite like to look at these things psychologically and you know because we're 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 living creatures as well we're part of the same ecosystem in some sense not really, but in some sense we are. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and and so why why do we feel this passion and drive to go and look for them? Why do we get up at six in the morning to, to get on a small boat and, and drive out 100 kilometers to, well, maybe not that far, but it's, it's isn't it interesting to, to, to discuss? What, any thoughts on that? Well, especially when it's a very hostile environment for someone who gets seasick. Do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I should sort of put a caveat around it and i've never actually thrown up on a boat yet so the people who do would say maybe i don't get that seasick but i feel awful whenever i get on a boat and i take medication quite consistently for it so there's a substantial disincentive to spend a large amount of time besides the financial one obviously to spend a large amount of time out there looking for these birds for a psychological driver, I think part of it, for me at least, is a desire for finding rarities and engaging with the unknown. Because there's that element of investigation and discovery that's ongoing with seabirds generally. But there's also just the chance that today's will be the boat trip where that mega mind-blowing rarity goes past that's never been recorded in Australia or the Southern Hemisphere, whatever it might be. And there's definitely, uh, I mean, you paraphrase it as fear of missing out, but wanting to be a part of something like that and observing something so unusual. And I think seabirding does give a unique opportunity and exaggerated chance, if you will, for having that type of encounter. Thank you for listening to the Birding Today podcast. It's great to have you with us. If you're enjoying the show, don't hesitate to leave a positive review 
on whichever podcast app you're using at the moment. This really helps with getting the podcast up in search results and reaching more people. Thank you and back to the show. It's the same everywhere. That's the other thing with with seabirds is that they're they're highly mobile. And and so do you where's your main base for for these for these trips? Do you mostly go off Eagle Hawk neck or yeah. It's more recently I've been trying to, so to speak, spread my wings a bit in <laughs> Victoria and on the mainland. But the vast majority of my seabirding has been from Eagle Hawk Neck because back in Tassie, I was based in Hobart, which is extremely convenient compared to, I think, most mainland seabirding opportunities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the mainland there. Um, I, I, I had Paul Brooks on the show a couple of episodes ago. Um, yeah, and 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 that was really interesting to to discuss the the differences in birding in Tasmania compared to the mainland. Do you have any thoughts on on that? And and, and if so, um, what about Tasmania compared to the rest of the world as well? Because you know Australia itself is isolated as it is, but then Tasmania is like <laughs> even even more so. So another level again. In the- yeah. What what do you think about that? The differences in birding between Tassie and, and the mainland? I think they're largely driven by island biogeography, to be honest. It's a spectacularly depauperate fauna when you compare it to the equivalent sorts of habitats and land area on the mainland. Mm. When you think Tasmania has half the species that Victoria does as resident just off the bat, and that, that's an approximate figure, but it roughly bears out, which obviously gives you different opportunities. But I think one of the neat aspects about birding in Tasmania compared to either globally or more broadly on the mainland is that it is so compact it's in fact quite straightforward to get anywhere you want to, barring maybe some offshore islands in Tassie within a day trip, if you really wanted to, say for a twitch. Mm. And if you're going for a weekend, you could functionally drive around the whole state and accumulate maybe 150, 160 birds if you're really going for it. Right. And that's a substantial percentage of the birds that you can get in Tasmania as standard on any given bird watching trip at any rate so it gives you an opportunity to have quite a broad range of experiences for a state within a relatively short level of time and it also does facilitate i think exploring uh in that it makes it a lot easier to go and suss out, say, a random LGA as a wild example plucked from the e-birding part of the brain (laughs) and just head out there for a day and grill it and see what you can find. Mm -hmm. And then you're back home in the evening. It's less intensive than somewhere like Victoria where I've been doing a bit of kindergarten birding in Victoria, as I like to call it. I'm focusing on colouring in all the LGAs (laughs) on the eBird map to start with. Yeah, yeah. And to do that sometimes is a whole day trip just to go incidental, your one roadside starling, and then turn around and you're heading back home. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's the the, the size, it's a size difference, isn't it? And the habitat differences as well. Victoria's really, really varied in terms of its ecosystem types. Um, And... And I think, um, well, there's, there's there's lots to discuss in terms of the differences, but I'm I'm interested in. Um, so you've you've now moved to Melbourne. Um, maybe you can talk us through um, your PhD in in seabird conservation ecology, um, because that's that's really interesting. Uh, talk, talk talk us through that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as an overall topic and pterodroma gadfly petrels are one of my pet favorite bird groups Mm. so when i came over here i sort of had the idea i wanted to do a phd but hadn't really worked out anything more specific than that and whether i dovetail in on a project that's already guaranteed and funded and somewhat planned or whether I end up doing my own thing. And it only took me about a week's worth of reading to go, ah, ha, pterodromas, let's do that. (laughs) Yep. 
and I've ended up settling on a couple of Melanesian species that there's relatively little known about the Vanuatu taxon, I'll say, of white-necked petrel and the sympatrically occurring the um, species, subspecies taxon of collared petrel, the magnificent petrel. And I ended up on them because they both occur on the same island. It makes quite a nice study system. And there's relatively little out there that's known about them where essentially a colony has been discovered. But there's a blank slate in terms of understanding the at-sea movements and um, ecology related to threats or the environment. Mm. And it's an important sort of question and topic as well where because of the logistical challenges of ending up in a system like that relatively few people want to take it on and there's obviously the experienced and passionate seabird researchers who have been involved in that system who've done amazing work there already but it's difficult to find new people to get into that system and so when thinking about a phd and what i could do to maximize the value of spending three years on a given topic it ended up being a bit of a no-brainer right yeah excellent excellent and what so that that's still ongoing isn't it you're still still involved with that yeah very much so i'm only does quick mental mathematics i'm nine months into my phd oh interesting point. Yeah. so still very much at the stage of working out things like field logistics and funding and all of the fun stuff that has to come before you get to do interesting field work. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you got to do the hard stuff first. Yeah, and get it get it sorted. Um, that's that's such that's so interesting. And and so um, once once you get sort of past those hurdles, shall we say, um, you'll be able to kind of be quite hands on with the data collection, the 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 analysis of the data, and then the conclusions that you can derive from that data. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. So it's essentially a three year research project, which incorporates all of the processes. If, I mean, PhD is ultimately an educational stepping stone, right? It's out of, sort of undergrad honours university and into being, a, again, pardon the birding pun, but fully fledged researcher. <laughs> Yeah. And so after getting all of the sort of nuts and bolts sorted out at this stage, absolutely, it's going to be right through the workflow of field work and then analysing all the data, which I'm only slightly scared about. And then um, writing it all up and publishing as much as possible and actually getting the information that you collect out. Because... There's only so much point other than having a good jolly going to say Vanuatu and researching some petrols if you then don't do anything with that information. And so obviously the purpose after the field work's done then becomes to get it out there and to do something meaningful with it so that it can actually be used for conservation and ongoing research. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Because, yeah, the, the, the whole aim of conservation is to conserve right and 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 absolutely figure way figure out ways to to do that and but to to be you know to be able to to protect these birds we need to understand uh quite a lot about them to, if we want to conserve them effectively right absolutely mm. yeah mm. yeah and that's what's sort of lacking at the mm. moment for these species mm. there's a vague idea of how many there might be and the knowledge that they probably only breed on this one island, mm. which suggests if you think about applying, say, IUCN criteria for listing, it implies that they're at a relatively high threat level, endangered, critically endangered. It's impossible to speculate. But mm. up in that sort of bandwidth of rarity, but to actually formalise that and then do something about it, you absolutely need the fundamental information to say this is where they are this is what they're doing therefore these are the threats they encounter 
and knowing what those threats are, we can do X, Y, and Z, say, about them. Yeah, and even then, X, Y, and Z require is going to require funding and money and, and <laughs> you know, like all these different things that that we need to work together as a society to 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 achieve. Um, and sort of leap, leapfrogging leapfrogging off off of that discussion is how how do you manage? So you, I'm sure it takes up a lot of your time, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so how do you how do you find time or how do you balance that? sort of workload with your with with your kind of kind of quote unquote normal birding time <laughs> so sometimes for better or worse sometimes i spend less time on the phd than i should and sometimes i think i spend more but oftentimes it's good thinking time to go out birding mm. i reckon there's there is an element of escapism to just going out even if it's for an hour or two in an afternoon and You've got a particular problem. I don't know quite, say, how to pitch this next grant mm. quite right for making it as appealing as possible. Take that question, go off birding for even an hour or two and just let it sit, work away in the back of the mind. And maybe four times out of five, you come back with just a new spark of inspiration for that next, even if it's paragraph. So... I can often justify the occasional bird and getaway with some processing for the PhD. Yes. And it generally works out okay that way. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, that's a very good point, actually, isn't it? That birding... Well, and that also leads us to talk about group versus solo birding. I, I, I'm a big fan of birding alone for, for those very reasons that you've said, because we all have problems and we all have worries and things to overcome in life and there's no better place than you know <laughs> when i was up at mount lewis yesterday it's like oh, you know and at some it's paradoxically sometimes the birds almost become not as important as you being in the environment if you if you see what i mean it's like you you're, you find yourself in this in this amazing habitat you know i've written down these notes while you were talking escapism time to yourself therapy so so there's there's that side of things as well that the birds bring you out to these places <laughs> and yeah. then and then you're there and then it's like you're with the birds but you're also with yourself and 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 I think that there's definitely something in that and um and that's not to say I don't find group birding unenjoyable but it's just a different type of birding isn't it and a different mental process maybe as well definitely like you don't need a target mm -hmm. necessarily to gain some well-being benefit out of birding right oftentimes that's the best sort of stress relief from a phd day-to-day -day life whatever it might be it's just going out and seeing what you can find and like you say what you actually encounter sometimes is almost less material than the process not in that you don't want to see nothing but you can be quite satisfied by going and picking up. I mean, in my case, I'm based in the southeast of Melbourne near Dandenong. So there's not a huge amount of great local birding, but you can satisfy yourself with your red wattle birds and your noisy miners just going on a walk out to the nearest park and sitting for a bit, that's contemplating, right. yeah. getting back to it. Definitely. Yeah. And that's what birds offer that uh, the other animals can't really because I know that a lot of birders are in, also into reptiles and, and insects. And I, I, I myself, I, I really enjoy also looking for other things, um, you know, and, and and trying to identify all the creatures that we live around. But, you know, birds are, are special because they're just so ubiquitous. And they're just, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm going to finish this sentence, but can you see my train of thought? It's like they're everywhere. They're everywhere for for all to see wherever you are. And yeah, I think it's that visibility that makes that makes birds and birding so popular. Mm. What do you find looking for other wildlife about the process, though? Because I reckon you can also get certainly from birding, and I would imagine I'm getting more into other animal groups, particularly now that I'm over on the mainland and there's lots to chase in say herps compared to tasmania but in that process there's still 
the travel and being out in an environment and looking for something. And it does sort of run contra to the point I was just making about how you don't need a target, but whether you could still get the same escapist relief from chasing, say, it, it herps, amphibians or mammals while just being part of the process. Yeah, I, th I think that there definitely is the same thing. If you ask a, a herper, you know, <laughs> you know, on the Herping Today podcast, they could be talking about <laughs> exactly the same thing, and they and it would be it would be synonymous with birding, I'm sure, because you have all the same elements. You have, you know, as you said, the travel. You've got, um, you know, you got to know the you got to know the reptiles you're looking for and where they live, um, you know, and and how to identify them. So it's all quite synonymous. Um, but it's a good point that you make about the process. Um, uh, I, I, I'm just so interested in everything that I have to. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like it's 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 not restricted to birds, but although although birds are my main thing, um, but it's just life is you know life in the in the proper sense of the term life is so fascinating. Um, yeah, and, and it's not, a great way to be. I yeah. reckon, and I've absolutely come to realise that it's worth looking for taking in and appreciating everything because you go to some far-flung location in the hope of finding one bird and then turn around and leave compared to chasing up everything else that's there and appreciating all the other wildlife it seems like a very logical next step to take in appreciating environments and ecosystems so it's absolutely an element to where I get more into other taxa as well. Right. The, the, the flip side to that, though, is that, you know, you can't know everything. So the, the more things you pay attention to, the more diluted your knowledge is going to be about one specific one of those things. In a way, Does, do you see what I mean? It's like, yeah. when, you yeah. know, a birder who only focuses on the birds um, is gonna is gonna have condensed knowledge because they just know about birds, but um, if you, if if you bring into the picture spiders, say or butterflies, that's <laughs> two two more groups that are that have you know that are very big groups of animals um, that that you have to borrow some. I, I, I'm not some expecting hard this. Drive like a, do you know what I mean? Exactly. Memory capacity. <laughs> exactly. The, the the hard drive of the brain. You know. So, and and this is just a, us thinking aloud. But um, but but I think it's interesting to have those discussions. Um, because there's so much to see everywhere. You know. Definitely. Absolutely. It's very difficult to know where to draw the line in what you're interested in. Yeah. No, that's right. And and, and to bring it back to Tasmania and and to to link that to what to what you've just said. You know, there's so much to see. Um. Because you, 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 I believe that you coordinate the Twitcher shot, the Twit, there, Twitcher thon, in uh, in Tasmania. Is that right? Up until this year, I did for a few years. Yes. Right, right. Are oh, you, 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 are you going to miss that? Absolutely. It was lots of fun. Really, really enjoyable. I'm going to miss being part of the Twitcher thon in Tassie for as a competitor as well to be quite honest <laughs> i mean it's 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 so multifaceted the, the whole birding world like you don't that that's another thing you don't have you probably don't have herping twitchathons i mean there's an idea <laughs> that's an idea herping yeah. today podcast can <laughs> advertise <laughs> that's right um but 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 to bring it back to the birds then i, I believe you're also on the the bird life tasmania committee is that right i was for a couple of years i've stepped back now that i'm in victoria i've stepped back from that now yeah yeah and and what what did that involve what's what's it like being on you know not only in tasmania but like the the, the committees that bird life has Do, what 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 does that entail it, i had a relatively minor role with bird life tasmania in fact i helped manage um the social media for a couple of years oh, primarily nice. Nice, and yeah. so that was a lot of facebook content a bit of twitter content no i had to learn what twitter was at first being a bit of a luddite but we got there and ended up with some twitter content and uh, managing things like promotions around different awareness days mm -hmm. and 
the organizations events those types of things mm, mm. um but it was a, a great learning experience being part of a relatively well-established regional bird life committee like that when when we zoom out a little bit um from all of those specifics i also like to to have a you know with 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 every guest that comes on a, a you know, um, a bird's eye view of birding. So, Peter, what do you think makes a good birder? I think it's almost, it's, it's subjective for sure. Or I think it's definitely a matter of opinion what makes a good birder. I feel like the people who I look up to and take the most inspiration from as birders who I would regard as as good or great birders are the ones who always have a sense of curiosity inquisitiveness about the natural world around them and a desire to learn and explore I think that a birder who's driven by that sort of mentality tends to end up in new areas, different places, discovering new things and really pushing the boundaries and being at the forefront of our knowledge as a broader birding community, even if it's just finding new sites for desirable or good birds or whether it's actually pushing forward more academic scientific advances. I think if I had to pinpoint one relatively nebulous concept as defining a good bird, or it would be that sort of mentality of curiosity and love of learning about birds. Yeah, I love that. That's a very good description, I think. And I agree with that because, you know, the, the, the curiosity is what drives us to, to you know, to, to go birding wherever it is. And, and, and in turn, that then means that we're going to learn something new because it's a new place and you, you have lots of those dynamics. I love that answer. That's very good. And what I often come down to um, in these conversations is that there's, there is two sides to that question, which is there is a technical reality to it, how, how to be a good birder technically in terms of your, you know, your, your, your knowledge and your ID skills um, and all that. And there's also the social side which which pertains to you know um dealing with other birders and communicating with other birders and non-birders so that's that that's also a distinction that i like to make i think i think it's it's those two can you think of another side to it apart from technical and social oh great question because already i think you know the technical side i potter along at for myself <laughs> I fall flat on my face when it comes to the social side of things. Oh, really? Definitely, yeah, I reckon I'm not at all good at managing the social side of things. Anyone who frequently corresponds with me on um, Facebook Messenger would know just how terrible at it I am. Right. And why do you think that is? Is it because you're, you're, the technical side of birding is more important for you, like in some sense, or... Is it just because you, is, is there a reason? I, I do think ultimately I am quite an introvert. Mm. I enjoy the company of other birders and going out birding socially, j just as you were saying. Yeah. It's great fun going out with mates or a group of friends, but it, it's draining. No, I, I can equally happily bird solo and get a lot of fulfillment from that. I think it's also just, I'm not good with, technology a, t a telephone or a computer like ebird's fantastic and having the phone program to use in the field is a wonderful innovation and makes it a lot more accessible i just i can't do it i try every now and again again my attempts to be a more diligent ebirder but just coming and going from the phone all the time doesn't really work for me and so i'll find i just put it down and walk away and a day or two later i go oh where have i left my phone 
So... <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, I'm sure we could all take a take a, a leaf or take a page from your book. Like it's 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 because we're all so hooked to our phones, you know. And it's, and, and that's linked. That that's come into birding now because I'm I'm when I'm when I'm birding, I'm half the time looking down at my phone, putting the list in. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? It's like it's it's always yeah. it's it's always there. It's always present technology, even though it's I, very whenever helpful. I mm. yeah, whenever I'm trying to actually get into e-birding in the field i absolutely feel that i'm sort of coming and going from the phone and then i realize i've spent five minutes trying to put species in and i'm not sure what's gone past uh, and yeah it becomes I, I find it not invasive but a little intrusive maybe mm. to the experience of being out there for myself it works differently for everyone mm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. i think if you do want to be a good social birder and keep up on that side of things then definitely don't take too much belief out of my book <laughs> well that's the thing isn't it like it's it's all about i guess coming to some sort of balance i'm 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 also quite introverted actually and that's why i also appreciate birding solo um but i'm just trying to think whether or not i feel that that my that my ebird experience in the field is intrusive i guess i guess somewhat it is because you've in the back of your mind as we were discussing earlier it's it's such a great it's such, it's such a great time and place to have that escapism and therapy and time to yourself and i wonder if the phone and the listing aspect of it maybe takes a little bit out of that a little bit Potentially. Mm. I, I reckon it, it certainly does for me. Mm. It, just because it's interacting with the phone and I'm not great with it. And so that's mentally taxing. But certainly, sort of referring back to the process of it all, I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who do get a lot out of accumulating the list as you go and interacting with it in real time compared to... Because I equally, and this is where I'm a less diligent e-birder than I could be, I do then come back from the field thinking yes this will be a great opportunity to put in a quick ebird list but sitting down at the computer for five or ten minutes to do that is another task <laughs> yeah that's where, right where someone else will get much more fulfillment out of just doing it in the field and right. having that whole experience as a microcosm unto itself that's right that's right and, and and also in the field i think when you use the app you know it, it tracks your distance and your gps and all of that so that's helpful data as well in some sense i guess but um but for me the aim of of having my phone out and doing the list in the field that's not that's not the goal the goal is to is to have if for me to have an accurate reflection or database of my life list essentially um that's that's why like if, if if there was a way to just mentally do it or you know 100 years in the future if they invent some sort of brain chip or something that, that you can just okay you know uh two golden bowerbirds uh you know three large build scrubber and you can say it out loud and it'll just yeah anyway i'm rambling log, but... log it somewhere yeah, yeah. that's right it's, it's yeah, all wouldn't about... that be the dream it's it's all about logging it i think isn't it and and having that the desire to have all of your sightings so somewhere secure. Definitely, definitely. And that's where I've ended up with getting into LGA birding mm -hmm. in Tassie around about the middle of last year, I'd say. So only six months before I up sticks and moved out, I went, hang on, I've been traveling around Tassie for all this time, doing all this birding, and I've got a massively unrepresentative list for each lga and that did my head in until i did some road trips around and just accumulated a slightly more healthy looking total for each of the, the counties <laughs> right 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 and the same... I, I definitely get that feeling of wanting something of an accurate record of where i've been and what i've done mm, that's right and, and and i guess for for older birders it must be quite frustrating because they've spent you know 30 40 years you know and not only in australia but birding overseas and and you know ebird has just been around how long has it been around seven years now or something yeah they're, they're about yeah even a bit longer maybe mm. oh nine i think right right Perhaps. well so, and that's quite that's all things considered that's quite recent absolutely yeah and and so it, you know and yeah 
to have your your list um, stored somewhere it must be difficult if you've you know if you've been birding for for ages. But and, and, and talking about um, you know older birders, there's also a, you know a, another category um, of new birders. Um, and and this is one of the questions that that I wanted to ask you, um, if you had any birding tips for young birders or new birders who were who were just beginning, any any thoughts on on initial tips or or advice um, for for new birders? I always reckon get stuck in and go for it. I reckon one of my biggest regrets is when I just well I was a couple of years into twitching. And I was in first year uni. So I was still just on the cusp of, I'd just got my P's to be able to drive myself, <laughs> but hadn't really got it together, didn't have my own car. So there's all those sorts of restrictions going on. And two days before one of my, it was actually my first year biology exam, a rose crown fruit dove showed up in Devonport, so three hours away up in the north of Tassie. Really? Yeah, and there was, I mean, maybe this isn't a great example because it would be don't do as I wish I had done, but I ended up going and doing my biology exam instead of joining a carload of other birders and twitching a rose crown fruit dove. And, of course, it was never seen again, and I still haven't seen a rose crown fruit dove in Tassie, but a pretty big rarity. And I've always regretted not, just going for it even though it would have meant offsetting a biology exam and all the rest of it and so to take that back to a slightly more reasonable and realistic level I always reckon just get stuck in even when you're starting and you're thinking oh is it worth going and getting that bird that's a bit rare locally but I can see it elsewhere and maybe I'll get it in future just get stuck in and go for it I reckon bite the bullet and Mm. yeah spend time on the books as well if it's a new birding situation especially and it's difficult because having started reasonably young I still started with books but it's at a different sort of age, but you can get so much information out of doing your pre-reading, I think. And it's because I could characterise it as being a more experienced bird, but going to a new location as well. You maybe have the, the toolkit to be a birder, but you're new to that area. And the first thing most people I know would do is go and hit the book do the background research, work out what they were going to see and when and where and all the the possibilities, and then go out and have a much more fulfilling and rewarding experience for having done that background work. And so even starting out locally, just looking at resources to understand what you're likely to see, when you're likely to see it and where, I think can add a vast amount to the experience because it takes away a lot of the intimidation, I think, that some people can encounter. And this is mainly from my experiences um, as part of the University Bird Watching Club where we did have a fair few newer birders who were getting into it. Right. And many of them found the, the just the number of birds out there to see quite off-putting you know where do I start if you read and do the research to work out okay actually if I'm in Hobart say there's maybe 50 birds that I'm likely to encounter on a Mm. local little bush walk Mm. it makes it digestible and you can get so much more than out of your field time yeah by having a a sense of what you're up to Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's uh, yeah there's, uh, there's a lot in that Definitely, and the intimidation factor is is something that is interesting as well. Um, and I and I would even say, if you know, if there's a new birder listening, where do I start? It's like, I think your example of Hobart. It, I would even go smaller than that. I'd just say go out to your local park or even a corner of your park, and start to and and sit sit there or or have a walk around, and just and, and and keep going there every day or every week 
and and that way you're going to start to know the birds at an extremely local level and then once you've mastered that corner of your park do the whole park and then you know if there's a pond in, on the other side of the park then you'll start to get those birds as well and then once you've once you're familiar with the whole park expand do the go you know uh, go to another park with that's that's different with different you know do you see what i'm getting at so it's going from the extremely local to the less local gradually and and with that comes more birds but but since you've started locally you, you've already covered what's what's in the local center yeah sort of building familiarity as mm -hmm. it were once you know what's around locally even if you're going somewhere different you can at least recognize that something's different and that's one to go away and chase up later mm, exactly work out what it was tackle the id challenge i guess in intimidating is maybe a strong word D disconcerting yeah. might be a good one yeah that there's just so much out there to see but i also wouldn't ever be put off by that in that it's a really good idea to start locally and get an in-depth understanding of what's around you at close range. Yes, yeah. But if there's a motivation to go out and do something crazy and see something different, that bird you've always wanted to see, for example, I mean, it's a sort of tragically Tasmanian example to say, but for me, one of them was a painted button quail. I, I went the length and breadth of Tassie chasing that i'm actually amazed you've managed to get what is it about three quarters of an hour in now and i haven't brought up my button quail story <laughs> okay <laughs> let's settle down I just, yeah, yeah. W w went and went for it that was what i was really keen to see okay i went and tried to find it and had some uh, disappointing but also because i dipped a few times but also uh, amazing encounters and fascinating experiences because of just going and looking for that one bird. So there can be value even when you're starting out, I think, in picking something you really want to see and just going for it. Yeah, because then that's that's also at the local level, but not geographically. It's local at the species level that you want to see. Mm. Yeah, true, true. Mm. That's a great point. Should we, as experienced birders, be doing more for, for new birders? Interesting. I feel like particularly there, there is a very open and welcoming community online nowadays. Mm. And it took me a long time to find that, again, technology not being a strong suit, but especially on Facebook, there's quite a lot of interactivity and there's an enormous capacity now to engage with people who've been at it for even decades and gather information and just have conversations even, link up with someone local and go birding together. I feel like maybe it's from a perspective where that sort of social media type of interaction is less normal for me but i feel like there's quite a lot of capacity out there for someone who's getting started to jump online if you know what sort of bird watching groups you're looking for and start having those conversations and interactions with people more broadly i think that platforms like ebird and the fact that so many really, really capable and experienced birders are putting lots and lots of information on eBird does help with accessibility as well. Mm. I feel like it's a good time to be starting off or to be building an interest in birds and bird watching because of the resources that are available. Right, exactly right, yeah. And the, the, the learning factor as well is really um important for for new birders but also well all birders um learning but, but you learn I, I, I in my experience i learn best from people not not books um and that's somewhat of a handicap and of course i i, I own lots of um you know bird books and I, I pour over them just as any other birder does but you know i really 
respond well to learning from from others because I have that experience in my head. Oh, oh yeah, I remember, you know, oh, I remember John said that or I remember um, that, uh, you know, in that instance, we saw this bird and um, Jan told me that uh, this or whatever. So you have you have that side of of things as well, don't you? Mm. Definitely different people learn different ways. And I suppose I've put forward a relatively literature heavy perspective on learning and gathering information about birds because that does work well for me and I can sit down or enjoy sitting down with a book and gathering it all up that way whereas for someone else like you say it may well be going out with someone in the field and instead of looking at a picture of whatever it might be even a silver gull and going okay red bill gray back white underneath and all the rest of it it's having someone point that out and describe it that sticks so yeah yeah definitely different learning styles are a factor in how you might want to think about getting into it Mm, yeah yeah and especially i guess in australia where there's maybe fewer birders than in the in the birder heavy countries like um the uk or the us right and that's partly due, I think, because of the just the population numbers. But maybe not. Maybe there's something else. Um, but uh, but yeah. Um, any, any last thoughts on that? Oh, I think I'd be speculating. To be quite honest, it's a sort of socio demographic field that I'm not well versed in. But I think that there is an element of scale to it, right? With population size, yes. versus land area to cover. Mm. again it's a big proposition to go out and cover the whole of australia and there are plenty of people who are local birders and the same applies for all parts of the world obviously but it maybe is more birder dense in areas where it's easier to cover more in inverted commas, for relatively less travel investment. Speculation, again, on my part. But Mm, mm, mm. That makes sense. Well, ever since I I moved to Cairns, I've noticed way more birders up here. And and you you would expect that, wouldn't you? The place affects the the, the social birder life, (laughs) you know? the, the, The place is what dictates the number of birders, perhaps, Maybe not, but you know, this is all speculation again, and maybe um, you know, someone listening can correct us. But it's interesting to talk about, isn't it? The the, the socio demographic side of birding, for sure. Definitely, mm. definitely. But being somewhere like Cairns, you're certainly in the right place for it. Arguably, the best place for it. Well, I think so. It, it, it might be the the you know the birder capital um, of Australia in in some in some sense. Um, but um, we're, we're, we're getting close to the, to the closing questions, Peter. So as you alluded to um, earlier, the question is coming now. It's what's your favorite bird? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> if, uh, if I could pick a group of birds, I would go gadfly petrels mm. and pterodromas. Mm. And they just encapsulate everything that I find fascinating and wonderful and generally spiffy about seabirds. But if I were actually picking a specific bird, a a species, say, for a while it would have been painted button quail because I sort of glossed over the story earlier, but I'd missed one by a day on some surveys in Hobart. And it was the first record that they'd been in Hobart for quite some time, or certainly right. chaseable record. Mm. And I went back to the location and missed it. And then again, and missed them again. And so began the vendetta of chasing every painted button quail record in Tassie for about six months. <laughs> and I covered about 4,000 kilometres or so. Wow. For naught. Like twitching a, a male with chicks on the roadside the next day, coming up short. And I'd sort of given up because next uni semester had started and I thought, well, I'll focus on studies for a bit. And I was driving down my driveway at home and there on the side of the road was an adult female painted button quail the the best bird 
painted button quail you could hope to see right there. And I reckon the rubber marks on the road lasted about six months because I slammed on the brakes, jumped out, didn't have my camera, anything, ran back to the house, came back and ended up having just about to give up because it had run off the roadside, obviously, and all that mayhem. Just as I was getting back in the car, it ran across the road <laughs> right in front of me. And I had this amazing view of it passing across the road. And that experience was it for me for several years but more recently i think i'd go with masked owl oh yeah because again it was a bird i saw one when i was quite young and we were out camping one night and there was a crashing in the tree and my brother said oh there's a masked owl and i went oh it sounds like a possum doesn't it a huge amount of noise walked over and it was a really big female castanops mask. So the Tassie, the currently subspecies of masked owl. Wow. All rufous, dark, fantastic looking bird. And at that relatively green stage, I went, oh, that's nice. Cool. And for eight years, I didn't see another masked owl. Wow. Yeah. And it was getting to the point where I was looking at people reporting them and getting photos and thinking, you know, I'd really like to see masked owls like that and thought, well, if I'm going to do that, I'd better put in some effort for it. And so ended up doing a fair amount of spotlighting out around the back of Hobart and up the east coast of Tassie. And it took me a few months again just to work out what I was doing, where to go and sort of crack the card as it were for myself. Yep. Yeah, but it ended up just before we left Tassie. My fiance and I were out spotlighting one night. Last stop of the night, we um, were walking around the edge of the car, and a bird had come in and landed right next to the car and just sat and watched us. And we ended up leaving it, and we maybe spent oh five, ten minutes just through. We had a bit of red light, bit of thermal, and then took a few photos just watching this bird sitting barely more than touching distance away. And it was the the holy grail bird since yeah. the painted button quail had come around. Right. And again, that experience just sort of cemented that this is a special species. Hmm. And so I'm still currently riding on the high of that, and I reckon I'll go with Master Al. That's amazing, and, and and this has come up before on the show where it's not it's not the bird as such that is that is the center of it because it's the experience and the circumstances in which you saw the bird that make that bird your favorite bird to some extent. Definitely, I think, you know, Definitely. and and it's it, it's not like yeah, and, and the bird itself is it is is the center of it, but it's but you know a center needs things around it and the things around the bird, the experiences and the mood in which you're in, the circumstances in which you're in dictate that memory. It's, it, it really is astounding, isn't it? And, and, and so what's the, what's the next Holy Grail bird for you? Cause now you've seen, you've seen those two. What's next on the list? <laughs> Ooh, new bird. I reckon it, it's a sort of spec of seabird that I reckon we can get off eastern Australia at some point. I reckon a Massatiera petrel. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Would be pretty top notch. It would that. be a first for Australia as mm. far as I'm aware, if we ever saw one. But I would equally travel to see what I reckon they're pretty neat looking spectacular gadfly petrels um, that w would be well worth traveling for a pelagic just to catch up with in their own right but I reckon there'll be a day where one's caught off the east coast of Australia and I'm hoping I'm on the boat when it happens <laughs> you heard it here here first folks yeah yeah um bold prediction <laughs> oh that's great and you you talked about travel as well is so if you had two weeks of unlimited expenses and you could travel anywhere in the world for birding where would you go 
sub-antarctic island mm. i reckon if i weren't uh, hopefully heading there for a phd i would say melanesia oh, yeah. and traveling around the islands there but totally pie in the sky can do anything i would make sure i hit macquarie island in a run around some of the new zealand and australian sub antarctic yeah oh, epic yeah breeding seabird islands are fantastic places to visit and particularly from a tasmanian point of view macquarie island is in tasmanian jurisdiction oh. counts as part of the hewan valley lga so it's got some bizarrely fantastic seabirds and penguins and things on it. fabulous oh. but um it's always been one of the, the dream destinations yeah oh there's so many of them as well you know the whole wherever you are in the world is is has has a highlight of sorts you know what i mean it's just the the variety of birds is outstanding and and i think that's a fabulous note to end on peter and you've, you've been an absolute joy thanks for your time thank you so much for having me on all right all right well um all the best happy birding and um keep in touch um uh, my, my my dad lives down in southeast melbourne so if i'm in the area i might send you a message and we can go birding and Please do. That'd be fantastic. Let's do it. All right, mate. Thanks for your time. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of the Birding Today podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about the show, you can follow me on all my social media platforms. The links are in the description and in the show notes. Um, and if you want to take it a step further, you can also support me on Patreon as well. Thank you, happy birding, and I'll catch you in the next episode.